Stickling uh, Step Project Global Consortium and uh, SPJMR, which is SPJR Institute of Management and Research. The STEP Project Global Consortium is an initiative which was launched to explore entrepreneurship practices within family businesses and strives to promote transgenerational entrepreneurship within family businesses. So we're looking at um, the initiative which aims to generate cutting edge research while offering best practice solutions to sustain entrepreneurial families across generations. So that's a little bit about the STEP uh, Project Global Consortium. The, con the conversation series itself was initiated in 2020, as Arpita was just informing us. Uh, it is in the third year, and it's a series where we get uh, well-known academics, scholars, uh, and practitioners to converse with us on matters which I think is dear to all, all of us and which we hold close to our heart, and that is about promoting transgenerational entrepreneurship. So this year, it is SPGen Institute of Management and Research, which is the host uh, for the conversation series. This is our conversation series two. Uh, SPJMR is a constituent of the Bharti Vidya Bhavan, which is an institution founded by one of our freedom fighters, Ulpati Kanayalal Munshiji in 1938. It's an old business school and very well reputed. It has consistently been cited as among the top five business schools in India year after year. And in the year 2023, we ranked number one in India and 40 globally in the FT rankings list. Uh, the Family Managed Business Program and the Center for Family Managed Business is the pioneer for management education for family business science in India. And this program that we uh, kind of uh, offer to the science of family managed businesses is is in its 27th year this year. Uh, today we have with us extremely distinguished scholars. We have with us uh, Tanya Lipaho, we have Sarah Jack and Andrea Calibro with us who will be speaking on internationalization of family firms. Tanya is a professor of growth entrepreneurship at LUT Business School, uh, LUT University, Finland. And her research interests include family firm and SME internationalization process, networking for internationalization, international entrepreneurship, and family entrepreneurship. Um, again, her interest is in longitudinal processes, extremely ex extremely esoteric, extremely uh, difficult, uh, but also rewarding. And her research has been published in top journals, including JIPS, ETP, FBR, BJM, and so on and so forth. Sarah, again, is an extremely distinguished person and a distinguished academic. She holds the designation of Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship at Lancaster University, UK. And she's also affiliated to the House of Innovation, Stockholm School of Economics in Sweden and Odinsha Business School in France. Her primary research interests relate to social aspects of entrepreneurship, where she draws on social capital and social network theory to extend the understanding about the relationship between the entrepreneur and the social context in which they are embedded using qualitative techniques. Currently, she is also working in the area of family and entrepreneurship. And again, her publications are in top journals, JMS, ETP, Journal of Business Venturing, uh, Academy of Management, Learning and Education, Strategic Entrepreneurship, uh, Entrepreneurship Journal, and so on. She has also held the five-year leadership role for the Entrepreneurship Division of the AOM from 2018 to 2023. Andrea Calibro needs uh, no uh, introduction in STEP. He's the co-director of the IPAC Entrepreneurship and Family Business Center, and he's also the professor of family business and entrepreneurship at IPAC Business School France. He's the global academic director of the STEP Project Global Consortium, and he has again published uh, widely in journals such as Strategic Management Journal, ETP, FBR, Harvard Business Review, JBE, and so on and so forth. So, Welcome, uh, all three of you. It's a pleasure conversing with you on the internationalization of family firms. I would like to jump straight away into the first uh, set of conversations. Uh, I would request Tanya to start with telling us about internationalization through the lens of opportunity beliefs, which is what she has looked at using a very novel microhistorical analysis approach. So over to you, Tanya. And we'll play the slides for you, Tanya, and uh, we will then get into a conversation with you on your research. 
thank you. And thank you for the invitation, Tulsi, to join this Bye. conversation series. Okay, so did you already ask a question or? <laughs> no, so Tanya, uh, if you want, mm -hmm. we could uh, start with some questions or maybe you just want to set the context for this particular research. Uh, I would definitely want to ask you about this whole concept of opportunity beliefs, which you have uh, looked at over the course of 150 years. I mean, longitudinal research at its best. How did you arrive at this concept of opportunity beliefs itself? Okay, thank you. So we were actually looking for a suitable concept uh, for quite some time, but then when we had this unique data of, of um, CEO um, reports, annual reports and their own reflections, and from the starting point, a rich correspondence data of their personal and business correspondence and diaries, uh, we then recognized that since we wanted to put the individual to the core, and it's been something that has been required by IB researchers for quite some time, because most of the research is done on the firm level. But in practice, it's individuals who make the decision on what the firm will be doing. So opportunity belief as a concept looks at what a person believes and what might become in an uncertain future. So when we are looking at what... Uh, what brings you to certain decisions for internationalization? We thought that this kind of concept of opportunity belief, which is a bit like future oriented, would be a perfect match uh, for, for the approach. And it looks like it was because at GIPS, they liked it very much. And they sure. also liked our very novel uh, methodological approach of microhistory, which is a great couple with opportunity belief because it is related to looking at individuals in that historical context where they are. And this means that we were having like uh, somebody believing in something in 1868 and that context, how world looked like and how Finland looked like and how forest industry business looked like was completely different from how it looks like today or how it looked like in 1950. So microhistorical approach starts from this assumption of being uh, in a certain context that is uh, taken into consideration strongly of seeing what the person is really believing in, uh, thinking in a certain moment. So they are not comparable to current context, uh, what people were thinking, because, for example, we didn't have emails and, and many technological advancements of today. And also sometimes there was a world war going on and so on so that we all take into consideration in considering what they believed in and then how it comes back to the decisions for internationalization but i will continue in a while with some other aspects sure. but this is the starting sure. point sure tanya but um just to dig deeper into what you said uh you said that we were looking at their beliefs in 1868 or thereabouts so this kind of gives me uh, one of the um, concepts in behavioral economics, which I think you've also uh, used in one of your papers in Journal of Family Business Strategy, which is that of preference reversal. There is this concept of real time versus remembered. So real time mm -hmm. is that which is happening in real time, right, utility, and you're looking at remembered utility. So how did you go about looking at the beliefs at a point of time? In, so the microhistorical processes? Uh, well, actually, we looked at real time. Yeah, we looked at them real time because okay. uh, we always considered uh, the point of the date when the letter was written or the reflection was written. Oh. And, oh, right. and then we looked at uh, what was going on in the world at that moment. And okay. then we recognized how much the world context actually influenced on the types of decisions they made for internationalization. Okay. So this was ex indeed a real-time approach uh, from what they wrote exactly in on a certain date. All right. Okay. That, that's very interesting. So we'll jump to Sarah. Sarah, your work uh, deals with network ties and the role in facilitating internationalization. 
So um, again, you've drawn on the lens of social network theory and you've amalgamated it with family entrepreneurship uh, to study this process of internationalization. So what are the kind of network mechanisms that family firms use in internationalization? Hello? Hi, Sarah, you're I'm muted. Mute. Yeah, I don't know if you want to put the slide up, Tulsi, or do you want me to just talk? I think it's okay if you just talk, Sarah. That's fine then. So yeah, so you were speaking about what, what network mechanisms do family firms, you know, sort of use in their networks? And I mean, I've always, I've always come from things that are kind of more social network perspective, I suppose, as well. So kind of bringing this together with Tanya's work um, was really interesting. So um, there's a paper that I'll specifically refer to in here as well, which um, Tulsi, I don't know if you want to share or something afterwards. But I mean, really, the work that I've been involved in has always kind of shown that family firms tend to use, or tend to primarily use social networks at the end of the day. And then narrowing things down into network mechanisms for the work that um, Tanya and Emanuela and I did was uh, was really interesting because we purposefully looked here to consider the situation with network closure and structural holes. So what made this kind of area of work interesting for me um, was that we were really kind of zooming in close on network mechanisms, internationalization of family firms. And it was also interesting for me because historically, um, I came in into academia through industry. And before I entered uh, academia, I'd actually worked with a, a small firm, which was really a family firm, which had become international or gone international when I worked with them. So this was lovely to be at this, this point here. So delighted when Tanya said, did I want to get involved? So, I mean, network closure, which really emphasizes the positive effects of having cohesive, strongly embedded social ties within social networks where everyone is really connected in a way which means that no one escapes the notice of others. So everybody can see what everybody else is doing and the, the games that they're playing, I suppose, as well. And then structural holes was the other mechanism that we looked at here and describing how holes or gaps in a social structure exist and how actors located on either side of a structural hole have or, or can have access and circulate different flows of information. So structural holes is obviously Bart's work and then you've got network closure, which really comes more through from Coleman. And we kind of saw that in existing work in the initial formation of inter-organizational ties, firms prefer to focus on network closure, uh, but thereafter prefer structural holes since structural holes offers more flexibility in situations calling for organizational change. And in the context of internationalization, we saw that previous work suggested that further insight, insight about network mechanisms could actually be generated by focusing on family firms. And family firms are known for tending to look for ties, I suppose, with international people they, they can cooperate with, which they usually tend to perceive as being trustworthy, uh, long-standing. So there's that view that family firms are driven by both economic and social gains, and the fact that these coexist could make the social network mechanisms of family firms really quite unique. And I'll come back to what we found in this paper, because I think you'll probably pick that up in one of your later questions, Tulsi. So thank sure. you. And thank you as well for having me. No, no, absolutely a pleasure, Sarah. So, so we're looking at some of these research questions from the from the lens of the papers that Tanya have uh, Tanya has published in 2023 in GIFs, and Sarah and Tanya, in fact, along with Emanuela, have published in the British Journal of Management in 2021. Uh, Andrea himself is also uh, in the process of publishing a paper in GIFs, and uh, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Andrea, uh, first and foremost, a very interesting question, which which all, has always kind of uh, uh, intrigued, uh, maybe not the research scholars, but but I'm sure uh, the I study family firm internationaliz internationalization separately when there is already an entire body of research in IB literature, which is available. So Andrea, if you would want to start with that. Thank you very much, Tulsi. Thanks everyone uh, for being here also. Uh, yeah, it's it's not an easy question, that one. Uh, however, uh, so it's it's a bit easier for me because recently together with uh, Jean-Luc Aregle, Liane Nakano, Michael Hitt uh, um, and Christian Schwems, uh, we have been uh, working on this special issue in Journal of World Business. Um, which was really a, a nice opportunity for us to, uh, you know, 
try to be to I, I will not say bring the debate forward about family business internationalization, but uh, really to try to take it to the next level. And one of the difficult parts that we asked the different authors who were submitting their work is to really reflect on the connection between uh, family business theories, family business features, and what you already have in the IB literature, which is also, by the way, progressing. Uh, I remember when I started looking at this topic, and I think it was in 2004, so a couple of years ago. A um, couple of decades. The, yeah. <laughs> there, were, there were only really few things. And one of the work that inspired me the most uh, was, for example, the work of Professor Gallo. Uh, he had a paper in, uh, for example, FBR, and then there was another paper by Shaker, Zara, uh, which was one of the first one writing about this. But these papers were always a bit in between because it was a bit family business, a bit entrepreneurship and a bit uh, uh, international business. So I think that uh, we have to thank all the scholars and the ones which are working also right now on it for advancing this and also trying to uh, build a kind of own identity. However, um, what we did in this special issue specifically, um, we have tried to uh, realize a better connection. So it's to not just use theories to fit what you find in your data, especially for quantitative research, but really to uh, use assumptions of uh, IB theories, understanding how does the theory work? What does this theory want to predict? Who are the actors? And then also some context. If you change where, when, what does it happen to the theory? And I think that the power that uh, family business as a phenomenon has is really to um, add something, uh, you know, different, uh, something that can help progressing a theory. And we all know that uh, a good theory, uh, a theory is a good theory when uh, you can use it to, you know, interpret, explain, and help others. And this is especially something we do. If, I, if you just allow me um, one more uh, thought about this, um, it's about entry modes, for example, no? So if you go in the IB literature, you, you find a, a tremendous amount of knowledge on uh, what do firms uh, and different types of firms do when they go in a, in a, in a target market. Uh, so we are already at the question, how? So do you go yourself, uh, do you use it, whatever. And here is really, really beautiful because one of the, the things I struggled myself the most in publishing um, papers around family business internationalization with a focus on entry mode has been to say, listen, for family firms, sometimes it works different because even if the target country and the complexity of the strategy is very high, which IB theory would predict to go with an exploratory, less uh, uh, capital intense entry mode, like a joint venture or something a bit easier, some family businesses would go with a full investment, building up a subsidiary in a country that you do not know very well. Why? And uh, with this question, uh, personally with my team, we have struggled a lot in uh, explaining why family firms, there might be additional explanation linked to control, to power dynamics, to social emotional wealth, identity questions that might lead them to take a decision on entry mode, which is much more expensive and much more complex that other firms will do. So this is just a small example I would like to share. So the special issue, we are, um, it's under review because also, so that's fun, it's fun. All papers are published, but our editorial, it's still under review. So okay. we are second round. Uh, because we are getting comments to make it nicer, better, meaningful. And yeah, as soon as it will be um, so available, uh, we will be sharing. We have six papers and it's super interesting because they do all different things, different countries, different theories. There is something about historical and this connects to Tanja, military friction. How does historical frictions between countries in the past from a military point of view can, uh, um, uh, you know, impact the way through which some family businesses and non-family businesses go in specific countries to do business over there. So we have interesting things. Yeah, but I stop here, Tulsi. Lovely, Andrea. 
And on a lighter note, you might have Sarah and Tanya as some of the reviewers of some of those papers. So that's sure. just a lighter note. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I think uh, taking this discussion forward, and Andrea was speaking about the entry modes, but I think Sarah's work is very interesting because it talks about network mechanisms in the post-entry stage. And uh, you're also bringing in, so you were looking at explanations, Andrea, and I think Sarah and Tanya's paper talks about bifurcation bias and how they have brought that in as part of the abduction uh, process of research methodology to try and explain those network mechanisms. So Sarah, um, my question to you is, uh, how are you looking at Is it just me or is she freezed? I think she's thinking she has some network issues. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll just I'll just get talking and hope I'm answering the question. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much. <laughs> so yeah, I mean as, as Tulsa was saying there, we brought bifurcation bias together with the social kind of network um, literature as well to, to kind of really explore what we would what we were doing here, what the firms were doing here. And I think this was interesting because this was part of the abductive process as well. That, uh, that we were we were using to to analyze the data and to identify what was going on and what we really saw through the work was that uh, there was this new kind of network mechanism which we call network termina termination in the work which we really there conceptualize as a process for the ending of a network tie either by choice or force of circumstances or it, basically what it did was let, led to the breakup of the business relationship. And so within this particular paper, we really kind of extend the ideas around network closure and structural holes by bringing this to the fore. Um, I think Tulsi was going to carry on there and mention post-entry, but I don't know. Do you want me to carry on or does somebody else want to, to go next? Sorry, sorry, Sarah. I was thrown oh, out. There she is. I'm not sure. I, just one second. Sorry. That's okay. You know, I, I told you my network is bad today. But Sarah, I'm sorry, did you start answering the question? Yes, I started answering the question. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm happy to go on and say about the post-entry stages as well, if you want, or I can hand it back to you and you can ask, ask Tanya or Andrea. Sorry, I, I didn't understand. Uh, have you already finished your answer? I, I probably finished my answer. So if you want to go to okay. Tanya or Andrea now. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So uh, Tanya, I'll come back to you. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the details of your case firm, what was that firm's background, how is it that it had endured over such a long period of time, and uh, more importantly, has it been a family firm throughout, and uh, some details about your research methodology in terms of how many CEOs did you include in your study. Thank you. I could actually also use the slide if you can show it, but so it is. So it can is. We, can we have the slide, Joe, please? Yes, ma'am. So it was a family firm for 120 years. So the first four generations were family CEOs and that endured. They had like, like really long eras each. Next slide. Uh, yes. And um, yeah. so it was. Uh, established in, like I told, in 1868, and and it has had different names. And surprisingly, the name have been names have been changing a lot since the family kind of withdrew from the CEO position. And why that happened uh, was actually that the Finnish state officials, politicians, they forced Finnish family companies to mergers in 1980s and. When that merger took place, it was so that the fourth generation CEO became the chairman of the board. But mm -hmm. in practice, he was excluded from all decision making. And mm -hmm. what started happening, this is interesting, what Andrea brought up, that what does the family aspect really bring into internationalization? Here, um, the new managers who excluded the family CEO from decision making in practice, they started planning huge investments and he felt like it's not a strategy that they had been pursuing for 125 years with his 
great grandfather, grandfather and father and himself. So he decided to save the family money and they withdrew from the merger in 1993. But of course, the trademark and all of this, they are still there. For example, the soft tissue paper in Finland is called Serla and it's still like Serlakius name in that in that trademark. But anyway, so after that, uh, the company has been changing name and it's currently known as Metsa, Metsa or Metsa Board. Uh, and it, it has like about 10,000 people employed at the moment. And, uh, and it has been expanding greatly uh, in, in the decades after the family withdrew. But they did have many sub sales subsidiaries and they had like... Um, share of about 90% of exporting throughout the history with some fluctuations. And if you show the next slide still, please. So, um, so just some clarificatory questions, Anya. Uh, when yeah, you said the here, family... here you can see the family CEOs, the four ones, uh, uh, they're <laughs> when they lived and then below when they were CEO of the company. And then I had like five uh, professional CEOs uh, and like you can see, the professional CEOs had terms of about three to seven years, whereas these guys were there for about 30, 40 years each. <laughs> so so that's ma that makes it primarily a family business case. And I think this is also something important that we could be studying more in the future, these changes, because it doesn't mean that this family business case wouldn't be very in interesting and highly impactful unless it's not a family firm anymore because world changes. And for example, here, it was mainly a fin Finnish level political decision that almost all family firms in the forest industry ceased to exist. And here we can also see how much the context explains. If we didn't look at what was going on in Finland and in the world when they took this decision, we wouldn't understand that they were forced to do this and not like it was their decision to not to continue it in the family. But interestingly, the family owns one of the most significant museums in Finland. So they shifted their ownership to cultural heritage of Finland, and it still exists and, and caters one of the greatest uh, arts collections in Europe. Mm -hmm. even. Oh. Does the family has other activities? Uh, do, and they... And they own shares in many companies. So they withdrew from this company, uh, invested in many other companies and invested a huge sum on the museum. I think it was 5 million at least. And now it's so that if uh, if the museum ceases to exist, all the arts go to Finnish state. So so uh, it's kind of given to, to, to mm -hmm. Finland and not to the family, but the family members still own plenty of shares in many companies. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So Andrea, that brings me to a question to you. Uh, we saw how it was very difficult for the uh, ex-CEO who was a family member to kind of uh, uh, relate to some of the things that were going on once there was a, a, you know, an acquisition uh, or professional professionals came in. So my question to you is, how do internationalizing family firms transcend the cultural barriers? So in particular, when there is um, a certain kind of an entry, is there a preference for a specific kind of a partner or a specific mode of entry when a family firm is international internationalizing? What has been your experience with global family firms? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you, Tanja, for this uh, example, which is, 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 is really, really, really an interesting one. And... Uh, you brought the case of Finland, but there can be also many other countries. If you think at northern Germany uh, around the 70s with the extraction of coal, these businesses uh, in the 80s were all not dismissed, but it was forbidden to do uh, that type of activity. And they had either they either failed or either used technology to do something new. And this leads a bit to the question also of the, the partner selection, no? especially when you go in, different, in, in another country. Um, 
so how how do you select your partner for any kind of activities that you you would you would like to do and it's it's also about why do you go in a specific country uh, sometimes also besides uh, business reasons and let me uh, start with this example from an entrepreneur i worked with mm -hmm. interesting uh, uh, cake uh, productions traditional cake production um, then I was doing an interview about internationalization to understand when does it starts. It's now fourth generation, uh, more than 100 year history. Uh, and then we go to the point in the interview. OK, but your, your current target market. So where are you? Where are you going? What is the most interesting one? And then he tells me this is from Central Europe, uh, Himalaya. And then I said, oh, my God, but can you explain me why? Because the cakes that you do are super traditional. I don't know what people eat over there, uh, but I would like to be interested. And he told me, no, you know why? Uh, I have a hobby. Uh, what I do is uh, I do some skiing, jumping from the helicopters. Uh, and as I really like to do that thing, and over there they do this very well, I decided myself to explore if there is the possibility to do some business over there, which is a weird motivation. But what I'm trying to say is that the example helps a bit to say that there can be when you move into international markets and look for partners, there are different reasons. Of course, market reasons uh, related to industry, where you gain economies of scales and scopes and advantages. There are cultural uh, reasons. Uh, for example, if in your firm, you in your family firm, you are exposed to a specific type of culture, you have specific types of employees, the likelihood that you explore the country of origin as a target market for your business of those employees is very high. And then what I've discovered a bit in my research is that, and also other colleagues here and some others in the field, is that family businesses usually tend to prefer uh, especially joint ventures, which they feel to be the most risky one because there are some reputational risks also over there. If your partner is not a good one and does bad things, that they would like to do this, uh, especially with another family business. And here, connecting to the first question you asked me, family businesses here, allow me, <laughs> we are all family business scholars more or less, can uh, you know bring something to international business? Because what we uh, are uh, proving with our case studies worldwide, and there are some really important, think at Hero, Honda, on the other side, so more closer to you, uh, those joint ventures between family businesses usually last longer than what is predicted in uh, international business books. So if you ask someone, how, how long is the, you know, the life cycle of a joint international joint ventures? One, three, maximum five years. In some case, seven. Then why are there joint ventures in uh, different markets? Like, for example, I know some Germany, uh, India, and the case it's Forbes Marshall. That's the, the business, for example, in India, uh, in, uh, in Pune. Yes, it's in Pune. It's yes. interesting. They have a joint venture is more than uh, 25, 28 years right now. Um, and why this is interesting? It's interesting because in addition then to the all the, uh, you know, management opportunities and challenges that you might have, you have some additional ones. Because uh, if a generational succession happens in the partner that is in Germany and it goes bad, this can influence also your joint venture. But at the same time, there can be an opportunity. And the opportunity, if you are at different stages of your family business, you know, governance, you can learn from each other. I know of family businesses that send their next gen to do internship at the partner location to learn about the business, but also especially about the family. So I think that uh, to, to, to summarize, wrap up a bit this, uh, so a bit of the research and the practice experience, why um, it works. It works because uh, family overall as an institution is an institution that changes slowly in time. So uh, it has changed a lot. So if you take a meaning of family in Europe, it's different than uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. However, there are some basic values about, you know, care of next generation, bringing back to society, the importance of reputation, trust, and we can name some others that stay constant in time and also across culture. 
So when a family business looks for a target country and looks for a partner, for me, uh, it's easier to find uh, a good partner in someone who has a long lasting history, who is respected, who shares the same value. And this is also one of the reasons those joint ventures can work well. Uh, I have one paper which I titled Joint Adventures, uh, this paper, uh, because of course, I'm telling you one part of the story. However, uh, we are researchers, so I've tried to spot also cases uh, in which a relationship uh, in an international joint venture between family businesses has gone very bad. And I was asking myself, why? And one of the answer is a bad governance in the succession process. The joint venture has failed not because of not being profitable anymore or any management issue. It has failed because in one of the two partners, succession has not been handled properly. And this has had repercussion also on the business activities. Sure, Andrea. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and uh, I think I can. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yes. uh, I think there is something which... Uh, I'm working with Tanya on, and uh, there again, Tanya, our case firm in SAF, the kind of internationalization that they have done is completely based on tie-ups with, you know, dealers or any kind of ventures that they have set up in the more than 33 countries that they're operating in is only with family firms. So that is something, again, that they believe in. And uh, I think this whole point about the generational uh the succession and the governance aspects are extremely important. But I'm going to come back to Tanya first and ask her about um, the actual opportunity beliefs of the CEOs in different historical contexts, because that's something which is extremely exciting. What, what was it that your research um, helped you to uh, kind of uh, you know uncover in terms of the actual opportunity beliefs and how that has shifted across different historical contexts. Yes, thank you, Tulsi, for this question. I have prepared a slide for this as well to better illustrate the data, sure. which is so so massive, um, because of course, when I was going for 150 the... years, it so was- Can you share the slide, please? Yes, uh, and so this is now, um, Just yeah, so this is a bit like one. about the micro microhistorical approach, more like yeah, I just we'll, explained. We'll come back to this, maybe. Yes. Uh, oh, you want to, you want to explain this first? Uh, well, I I well maybe I can say a few words. So okay. I actually already uh, mentioned about the microhistorical yeah. approach that there you have that person and you you study it real time in that specific context. So you will look at how that person saw the world. And then you look what was going on in the world. So it is about zooming in and zooming out. Zooming out means that you look at the context. So we did a very careful investigation of what And that is the approach with micro history, that it is a match to uh, reveal something that you wouldn't expect. And for example, if we look look at firm internationalization literature where we are mirroring these uh, findings, it is kind of very much based on looking at, at the context where things are For example, we have international new venture theory and Uppsala model, and Uppsala says about incremental slower internationalization, international new venture model says it's more rapid, and they are in a way in, in a kind of dichotomy that they, they each claim that you are wrong. No, you are wrong. But actually, when we look at this storyline, we can recognize that they are both right. So if we look at the Uppsala model time context, we can see that the world was closed. We had quotas, tariffs, and so on. And the firms were not able to be so quick in internationalizing. Whereas when, uh, when the international literature, literature emerged in 1990s, the world was very different. We had internet emerging. We had uh, entered the second global economy stage. And actually this case firm was founded in the first global economy stage. And that's why it was also very international from the first moment onwards. But anyway, maybe, we... 
yeah that, that's that's a very interesting uh, point tanya i think you know the way in yeah. which you're relating the institutional context to the literature itself yes saying that, yeah, that that's yeah. amazing and IB literature has been calling for contextual accounts and individual view, and we do both. So it's not an easy task, but but still, like now that we look at the context, we can see that they these models do not need to argue. And that was one of our main points in the early phase of the paper. But then the reviewers, one of them was Uppsala model reviewer, another one for, was an, uh, an international literature reviewer, and they kind of felt that don't say this aloud. So then we kind of took many of those points away, but that's what usually happens with publications. But if you go to the next slide, because you also asked me about uh, what were the real opportunity yeah. beliefs of these individuals? Yeah. So I so can, can, of... can you change the slide, please? So I can show some examples. Joe, the next slide, please. On it. Okay, now, yes. So here we can see that what we did uh, on a larger scale. So uh, we looked at what was going on in the world, what was going on in Finland. We were looking at the traditional, Andrea very rightly was referring to looking at both international business and entrepreneurship and family business uh, to really take this understanding forward. So what that's what we also do that we have this operation modes, we have the foreign sales to total sales, here walking along with our analysis and then what when we look started looking at the world events uh, and what was going on with their operation modes uh, we combined them with these beliefs i have another slide where i can show them more clearly but anyway uh, please the next slide uh, we did this kind of analysis Next slide, Joe. Uh, and this go, and now, yeah, we come to this. So that was the whole time span combined with the contextual events of world wars, uh, joining European Union, joining EFTA, and so on. So when we started looking at what, we of course had like dozens of examples of each CEO. And now we have summarized just a few sentences all together. And that's what happens with research. Uh, so we can see here that they were, had quite different beliefs and the types of beliefs they had, it was very much driven by context. So in, in an era where Finland was uh, part of Charist Russia and there was barely any entrepreneurship or very little entrepreneurship in the country overall because it was forbidden. But then uh, Charist Russia gave us the freedom for entrepreneurship. So then what the first CEO believed in was in entrepreneurship and in, in using the forests that was one of our most affluent resources. Uh, so he had very resource and market driven beliefs. He's, he knew that Finland has plenty of uh, forests and he wanted to learn how to make business out of that. And then he knew that Charist Russia would be a perfect customer for them. So they would buy, buy everything that he's able to produce. Then when we moved to 1914 and 1941, uh, and we had the world wars, uh, we recognized that what the internationalization decisions were based on and what the thinking of CEOs were uh, primarily about, it was about partnership and political activities. And they did their internationalization this way. So what Finland did in that uh, stage was that Actually, this is related to Andrea's point about the markets being politically driven. For example, Finland uh, had no choice because they were an ally with Germany in the Second World War. So they had only German market uh, available and they lost Britain. Uh, when they became independent in 1917, they whole, lost whole Russia because Russia uh, had a, a revolution as well. And they didn't want to buy from Finland anymore because Finland didn't belong to Charist Russia anymore. So anyway, so then what happened in 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 the CEO beliefs was that they all the time talk of, talked about politics and partnerships with some countries and partnerships with Finnish uh, forest industry. So they basically worked together, worked together uh, all all Finnish paper industry companies. Then when we move on after the Second World War. Uh, 
the politically oriented beliefs continued. So they were thinking of, of the whole Finnish paper industry, all of these companies, what they should do so that they could have a good market position together. And they, for example, founded sales cartels when Finland became independent in 1917. And they operated through them so that they were able to negotiate a good price for all the Finnish business in forest business industry. Uh, but then they also uh, added benchmarking oriented beliefs. So the third generation CEO was very much traveling to USA in special and other Western markets. And he was benchmarking the US technology for them. And it was visible throughout the documentation that when they made a new decision related to internationalization or anything else, it was related to these political beliefs and then benchmarking. Then when we moved to Finland negotiating about EFTA since 1968 and joining it slowly, then they then the beliefs were very much internal development related uh, and driven from the industry. So they were looking at what companies in the world were doing and they started doing these mergers, acquisitions, because everybody was doing that. Everybody was making bigger units. So they entered into this as well. And then when we moved to the era, actually the family still remained as a major owner until 1993, but still the CEO became outside of the family since 1987. So that again started a resource and market driven area. And again, here we entered the global economy era. So they started thinking, no, we don't want to produce in Finland anymore. It is too expensive. Uh, and also like, uh, what markets want from us. They want more sophisticated, they want this and that. So again, then they started uh, going back to what the fir firm was originally about. So this is, for example, what these beliefs tell about. So they changed a lot according to the context when uh, when these, these CEOs were living amidst. Uh, amazing, uh, Tanya. That's, I mean, the entire micro historical process. I think is is so interesting, and I'm going to link it with uh, another question uh, in just a short while. But maybe uh, we can get Sarah to speak about and comment on Andrea speaking about the governance issues when it came to succession planning. So my question to you, Sarah, is how does the next generation or the induction of the next generation affect? the acceptance of the networks and also the acceptance by those networks uh, when it comes to internationalization. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting question. I mean, some of the work that I do with Alan Disqua Cruz, for example, you know, has shown that the networks in some way pass over onto the next generation as well. So I mean that's been quite an interesting perspective. But in the particular study that we were looking at for for the work that I did with Tanya, um I think from from that it's probably important for next gen for next gens next generation to be aware that they can and probably should move beyond that kind of close network tie situation. So keep those ties close, but you know practice bridging structural holes while being willing and prepared to terminate the ties that don't work. And I think that that was something that came through very clearly. But also that they should pay greater attention, I suppose, to the more kind of economic elements of their internationalization decisions over time. So not just, you know, working with people because there's that social contact, that social link, that social relationship that has been with the family for many years. So really kind of trying to, to move beyond that. And I suppose for, for longer term success in the continuity of the family firm, it's probably better to look for new ties to ensure that you're keeping the network evolving and growing rather than developing close ties with international partners. It might be wise to keep them more at a distance. And I think it's interesting when you think of how quickly and how far the, move, the, the world has moved on in really quite a short space of time. And I mean, Tanya started off by talking about how, you know, before it would be very difficult to get in touch with people in, in other countries. And Andrea touched on that as well. Whereas nowadays it's much more easy, but I suppose it's about how you keep those, those contacts at, at a distance, but within the kind of the, the network, I suppose, as, as well. But also things which will influence this are the nature of the firm and how the business changes over time. And it's interesting when you think of Tanya's work 
and what she's just described there about how that business has changed over that historical period, which she's she's looked at. But I suppose the, next, the new generation can kind of change their approach dramatically and, and offer further opportunities. And I think that's the way to look at things as well, is that they don't think that they're just working within the constraints of what's already there, but that there are opportunities to build and develop the business say, further and move things forward. Sure, Sarah, I, I completely agree with you. And probably that's where, Andrea, you can come in and uh, Sarah and Tanya's research is pointing out to network terminations, uh, which, which is kind of an anomalous behavior as we would want to look at it in family firm literature. But maybe you could help us understand how the family firms resolve these kind of anomalies or major disconnects which might happen in either family firm values, legacy, or identity when serving global markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is... Uh... It's it's an interesting it's it's an interesting and again I think also difficult uh, topic. Surely in research we we can find different things uh, in the uh, you know family business literature. That's of course my opinion because I'm still working on that um, about for example how how much is important for family business for example identity and identification. No, so you have a product you you are a business you do a specific type of product then you would like, it's a good one, you would like to go um, in a specific market, let's imagine China, I'm referring to a concrete case, and it's about some food products. And then some, some of your advisors that you hire and you pay, tell you uh, that you have to probably, if you want to be successful, you have to change your packaging, because the color that you have, it's not really well received in, in China. And maybe you would also need to probably change the denomination of your firm because uh, the customers will recognize you better. And then I've seen, I've worked with a family business um, and I've seen a decision which was really at the international business unit level escalating and going till up to the shareholder group. Uh, and basically, this group of of owners, there were there were there was a different view, not only linked to generation, but also to different um, um, uh, probably beliefs. Uh, again, we go back to the beliefs that the entrepreneurs had. And I've seen this family fighting uh, like hell uh, over this decision. And at the end, despite potentially profitable, they decided to not enter the market because this change were, uh, you know, creating some uh, identification identity issues for them. And they didn't want to do this. Another, so there is something there. Um, there is something in literature, but I think we can do a bit more here. Just for the researcher in the individual room, one literature I'm exploring in the IB uh, field uh, is especially the headquarter subsidiary relationships. Because if you go in IB literature, you find things a bit about this autonomy, control, but it's not specifically on the decision making. And here I have another example. And that's why I started then doing also some more research on that. It's about the German firm, automotive industry. If you are in automotive, uh, you know that you are organized as a firm in headquarters, regional ones. So if you are successful, most likely you have a headquarter in Singapore, you have another one in the US and especially in Detroit. And this was the case of this German family firm. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, I had some students, they were doing a master thesis about uh, internationalization, of course, of this group. And then uh, this poor student, because he came uh, across an issue. And the issue that the owning family had, the German ones, is that uh, they had a feeling that when they were uh, traveling uh, to visit the regional headquarters, so it's an important headquarter controlling other subsidiary in that world region, they had the feeling that the middle managers, they were thinking that this was a US firm. So no idea about the origin, the German origin and the legacy of this family business. And this created a big issue again in the, in the shareholders group. So what we, what we did with the students and then the group of researchers was to create a survey 
and trying to, they allowed us to ask all the employees at different level, middle managers, then higher manager to see um, how much they knew about the values, the family, from where it is coming, the history. And the owning family was right. We got less than 33% of the current, you know, people working in this middle manager line, which were aware of the origin of this business. Someone knew, yes, it's German somehow, but many of them were thinking this was a US firm. And this was a big issue for the owning family. So what I'm trying to, to say to wrap up, also looking at time, when you do research and when we work with family businesses on those issues, we have to be aware that sometimes some of the things that might be easy for other type of businesses like this identification, labeling, name, packaging, uh, and also, you know, connection between uh, the headquarter in the home country and the subsidiary, those might become sometimes some uh, constraints for some family businesses. So what probably we can do as researcher is to produce more knowledge that can help us understanding why this is happening, how you could manage this, which are the mechanisms. So this will be my uh, reflection on this question, Tulsi. Hi, Andrew, Ms. is not there in the session. She has uh, just dropped out. We'll wait for a few minutes until she joins. Uh, uh... Okay, so maybe we can go on because I'm looking at time also. I don't yeah. know, Sara and Tanja, what do you think about, about this, this aspect? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, like as per the agenda, we can uh, go ahead. I'll just reach out to uh, Tulsi, ma'am. I'll, I'll just see it's how fine, she it's can. Fine. It's fine. It's oh, fine. I think you. yeah, we can comment a bit more on that. And then I'm looking at time because time it's already free. Yeah, so I think yeah. that slowly participants will uh, will leave. So maybe we can have some final comments on on the session while Tulsi is coming, and then see if there is any any question from the audience which is coming. So we can we can take them to to any of us. Yeah. So I at I I would act, actually like to share also still something that how do I then add to current literature? So maybe one final slide I could share with you to kind of uh, have a conclusion to to understanding that study. So if there's the person who is sharing the slides, please share them again. So see you. Yeah. So please now. Scroll down. Um, to one of the sl last slides. Uh, yeah, so this is the model. Yeah, this one. So what does this opportunity belief approach and micro historical approach then tell about internationalization? Well, I was a bit referring to this Uppsala and INB model debate that it is not needed that they are so much uh, set against each other. We recognize that they explain the internationalization of firms of different contexts, emerging in different contexts. Uh, but anyway, so what does it mean that companies have this kind of resource-driven or CEOs have resource-driven, market-driven, partnership-oriented, politically-oriented, or uh, benchmarking-reliant rel opportunity beliefs? So then we recognize that they came from this kind of context, so we label it as social forces. And the social forces uh, were related to major social events like wars or new technology, um, new economic areas in special, which then uh, were related to internationalization conditions. So, for example, in an era where there are no tariffs or quotas, then it's easy to internationalize, whereas when we are in the middle of tariffs and quotas and political tensions, like we are beginning to be at the moment, then it's it's less easy to internationalize and it also uh, influences on your beliefs. And then we recognize that uh, the context uh, re uh, influenced also on if the companies were taking single firm or industry focused activities, like we knew the uh, era of um, recognized the era of World Wars War was very much about the industry or multiple firm uh, related activities. And that's how uh, the strategic actions for internationalization come. The investments, 
co-evolutionary arrangements and technological activities. They become uh, this. We illustrate it this way: how they become from they they derive from what's going on in the world, and uh, yeah. So in a way, it it is a cyclical process, and it's constantly changing on the basis of what's going on in the world, what kind of decisions they take. So. Uh, so sorry again, uh, I think I dropped out and it's it's bad, but uh, I think we'll just open it out to for questions from the audience because we I think we have already overshot our time. It's already 7.33, but uh, we can take some questions and maybe I can ask one question if there are no questions. But we can stop sharing the screen now, Joe. Yeah, any questions? Um, can I ask one? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so like anyone can answer. So recently I was uh, studying a lot about knowledge management in family businesses and a lot, a lot of Western research has emphasized on internationalization and how knowledge management has helped companies in internationalization. So if like anyone can have a take on this, that how family businesses can ensure the internationalization processes and that can get smooth with, because of knowledge management within them. I think Andrea has touched upon that. Uh, Andrea? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Thank you. So uh, it's it surely, if you look at, at, at the process of internationalizing and then moving, as also my colleagues were showing, there are different things over there. But surely um, it's a question sometimes also of uh, um, asymmetries in terms of uh, information, for example, that you have. So you have uh, asymmetries, which comes from, uh, you know, between the generations. Sometimes we have some studies showing that uh, uh, usually it's the new generation after the founding that uh, come with new idea, new ways of exploring the market mar uh, markets. But uh, especially on this uh, knowledge, knowledge management, one of the things I'm doing with some of the firms I'm working with is to propose them uh, internationalization has an opportunity to, uh, you know, learn as an opportunity to prepare the succession. What if our business uh, is, is a good one, but currently there are potential target markets, let's say free, in which we are not active. Why not giving the next generation the possibility to be entrepreneurs in those markets uh, away from their parents. Uh, this uh, helps a bit also to do this kind of uh, horse race succession. Is the possibility to, to earn, uh, to, to get knowledge, competences, but also uh, some kind of abilities, you know, in, in managing something on your own. And it can be a win-win situation because if the rule of the games are clear, it can be a way to grow the business but at the same time also to groom successors within the business and getting this expertise. So I, I, I'm surely think that many family businesses miss this opportunity for different reasons. So there is a, a lot to do that both from the practical and also the theoretical side. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can share a few thoughts about this because actually this comes quite well through from the data that I have been looking at this case that I just pre presented, but also other cases. So um, in family firms, it's it's been historically very crucial that they send out their, their uh, children out to factories that they own or resellers that they collaborate with to learn more, to find better. And this is especially the very well successful companies who do that. So they train well their children. So, for example, this company, uh, the first three CEOs, they sent their sons to Central Europe for studies in the best schools with other business owner families in Europe. So they made really good connections there. They Then they took traineeships in different countries and then they came back and took some minor roles and then finally they became CEOs. So so they uh, and then they also wanted their children to have a very wide knowledge of languages and i'm a bit worried at the moment how 
how much less languages um, currently stud uh, students are learning than they used to learn even in the 19th century. Wow, okay. All right. Sarah, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So Yashasvi is an FPM student from India, not from SPJMR, but from <laughs> another school located in Delhi. And thanks for joining in, Yashasvi. Um, Thank you. But, but I might want to just ask one concluding question that given the kind of geopolitics that is there today and uh, the greater ethnocentrism that we are seeing, how do small family businesses in particular overcome their burden of smallness, foreignness, familyness, and pursue internationalization? Well, I, I think I'm just gonna, I'll jump in quickly and then pass it on to you, Tanya. Um, I think that's an interesting question because I often think as well that these smaller firms, are, th these big organizations are like oil tankers, aren't they? You know, trying to turn them can take forever and trying to get them to do anything different or new or move quickly can take some time. Whereas your smaller businesses, I think, are a lot more agile and can be much more flexible and quick and kind of meeting, I suppose, what's what's happening in the market and what's happening um, in the, the more kind of global context as well. But that's kind of where I would, would go. But Tanya, do you want to? Mm, yes, I think that it's one of the biggest advantages of family firms that they have this high quality of trust within the firm and uh, abroad, they are uh, regarded as companies who would exist for a longer time. So uh, they are good people. So they have the strength of high quality of high level of trust. Uh, so that's how they can at best overcome that by looking for other family owned firms and building good level of trust via social interaction with them. Um, and that's actually what we also found in the study with Sarah partially about this. And also like that, uh, that it needs to be social enough and it's the early phase that matters. But then uh, over time, uh, you will be bifurcation biased if you only focus on the very few ties. So uh, like put by Kano and Ferbege and the creators of bifurcation bias, over time, you need to start doing other things than just having trustworthy few ties. But I think that that's the way to start. And that's the strength of family firms, the longitudinal aspect, and then the personal social presence um, of people and high level of trust for that reason. Yeah, what, what, what I can add from my side very, very shortly is that uh, there is also, especially for small firms in specific countries, uh, a country aspect uh, that is important. So policy making initiatives that bring uh, businesses from different countries closer. I know some uh, from France, for example, Italy, uh, and I'm mentioning two countries which also uh, can leverage, uh, there are others, but especially those two can leverage on a specifically made in Italy, made in France, uh, or the Mittelstand in Germany. So very small companies specialized in doing something very well, but often what they like lack is the, the time because there are too much focused on the operative side, getting they're getting things done and managed at home, and they miss some of those opportunities. And I think that also us as academic, we have a role in addition to policymaker. So the Chamber of Commerces, we can work with them, uh, creating initiatives that can help businesses in our country to know other businesses and allow me to see as we are at step that's what we are trying to do with step it's just on the back here in uh, amalfi coast we are trying to bring uh yeah next may uh, businesses from different parts of the world uh, yes. uh, and it's it's really really interesting tanja actually from finland we have 15 entrepreneurs who are coming family right. owners who will come to tra travel and will you know uh, and we try to realize a match uh, with other businesses in italy spain or other countries so we have also a role in facilitating especially the smes the smaller one in trying to you know get to the next level if it's wished sure thank you andrea um thanks sarah tanya and andrea for an absolutely uh very, very exciting discussion. And uh, thanks, uh, Arpita, Step, for facilitating this. I think we'll call it 
a, a night today because we are already at about 7.45 in India. And I'm sure that all of you will have um, your, your days, uh, you know, to come. And we will love to see all of you in uh, Amalfi Coast, if it is possible. Uh, I think we are all going to be there. And I can say that at least three of our SMEs have signed up for that. There's a Next Gen Academy, which we are going to be hosting at STEP in Amalfi Coast. And I hope to see many of you out there. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Lovely everyone. To see everyone. Thank you. Thanks to all of them, all of the Thanks others. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.